thanks to the Torrington Historical Society for sponsoring tonight's presentation. I'm really happy to be here, um, albeit virtually with all of you. Um, let me share my screen now and make sure that everybody's gonna be able to see my PowerPoint presentation. All righty, are you able to see my slide on the screen? We can. Looks good. Very good, very good. Let me just make a little adjustment to what I'm seeing on my screen. Okay, I think we're good to go. Uh, by way of further introduction, I should say that like hundreds uh, of thousands of American males of my generation, I fell in love with the guitar at a very early age. So here's my truth be told photo. Uh, here I am with my first guitar in 1966. And uh, I appear unsure as to whether I should be auditioning for Peter, Paul and Mary or the Beatles, but that was the mid sixties for you. And I should also say that uh, I too, like hundreds of thousands of American males suffer from what is called guitar acquisition syndrome or gas for short. So over the past half a century, I've owned a few hundred guitars, all of which have just passed through my hands, except for four keepers um, that are truly exceptional instruments of a lifetime, you might say. Um, back in 2004 on eBay, I acquired one of those keepers, a 19th century guitar, which completely changed the way I think about guitars and guitar playing. And my research into this guitar has led me to be here this evening. And here is the guitar that I received from eBay. It was uh, not particularly well described, but it's a typical 19th century guitar. What attracted me to it was the lovely flamed maple back. I just love maple. So um, I decided to spring for it. When it arrived, I found that it just sounds wonderful. It's one of the best sounding guitars I've ever played. Um, first thing I noticed about it were these extraordinary handmade brass tuners. Not only are they elegant, they are so smooth. They are as smooth as any modern um, tuners that I've ever had on a guitar. So I wondered, of course, who made this wonderful instrument I had just acquired. It was stamped simply William A. Pond and Company, New York and then a tiny little stamp of a J Ashbourne. Those were my only clues, but being a research of scholar by profession, I decided to find out as much as I could about it. Well, that led me to a little publication, a thin chapbook put out by the American Antiquarian Society, one Philip Gura, a professor at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And he had written this little pamphlet about James Ashbourne's Walcottville, Connecticut factory. Of course, I found out that Walcottville uh, is present day Torrington. And he based his writing on an account book that he came to own and which he then donated to the American Antiquarian Society. And I actually paid the Antiquarian Society some years ago to digitize this Ashbourne account book. So it is available in digital form should you wish to pursue it. It's a really quite extraordinary. And then Philip went on to include some of his writing about Ashbourne during this period of time in a book about C.F. Martin, who was Ashbourne's contemporary um, guitar maker. And Martin is known to this day because the company is owned by the fifth generation of the family there in Nazareth, Pennsylvania. So that also then uh, led me to the history of Torrington, Orcutt's book first published in 1878. If you don't have a copy, uh, the Historical Society will be happy to sell you one. Uh, so there's my shameless plug for the Historical Society uh, book shelf. Now, in order to understand Ashbourne and guitars in the 19th century, we need to um, look at how North American culture perceived Spain and things Spanish. And suffice it to say, and I've just lost my cursor here. Oh, there we go. Um, early North American culture 
very strongly prejudiced against Spain. Um, this Hispanophobia manifested itself in what was this, the Spanish black legend. And in a nutshell, I can sum that up as we're white skin, you're dark skin, we're Protestant, you're Catholic. Ah, but wherever there is darkness, there is fascination and intrigue. So we find it interesting that when the Islamic Moors were in the south of Spain and Andalusia, um, the Northern Europeans perceived the Orient or uh, the East, if you will, as beginning at the Pyrenees Mountains, uh, separating um, France from Spain. So to the WASP, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant imagination, Spain was this taboo world of Islam. It was very exotic. And this then produced a romanticization of Spain and things Spanish. So in the first 50 years of North American culture, we find this growing curiosity and fascination with things Spanish. The Spanish romanticization can sort of be summed up in the image of the Palace of the Alhambra, which exists to this day in Granada, Spain. The Moors ruled from here until 1492, a date that we all know very well from another context. Well, uh, Washington Irving, famous uh, American writer, actually traveled in Spain in the late 1820s. And in 1832, published his famous book, The Alhambra, uh, Sketches of the Moors and the Spanish. It was wildly popular. Number one on the bestseller list for years. It captured that romantic imagination. If you do a keyword search on the entire text, you'll find that the word love appears on 43 pages, romance and romantic on 30 pages, and oh yes, guitar and guitars on 24 pages. You can't talk about Spain without talking about guitars. And in fact, you can't picture the Alhambra anymore without picturing flamenco gypsies playing guitars. I should add that Segovia, the great classical guitar maestro himself, chose to do a concert in the Alhambra Palace. But in North America, we find the guitar being adopted as a parlor instrument for women. It's romantically associated with utopian ideals. It represents an escape from the urban world. Um, as a non-orchestral instrument, it was considered acceptable for women to play, in fact, proper for women to play. Um, it embodied domesticity. Um, the parlor was coming to the fore in the house in the new emerging middle-class home. And quite unlike the piano, you could take it on a picnic. Um, and it was much more affordable than a piano. So as one scholar notes, the guitar was a feminine instrument that stood in opposition to the male world of city and uh, technology. Also, we should note that in referring to the Spanish guitar, intentionally publishers were trying to stir up images of uh, Spanish women as being quite seductive. So the popular image in the middle of the 19th century was this one, which was reproduced um, quite often. And it was always accompanied by this text. Fair they are not, these bronze daughters of the sun. And yet theirs is a wild and gypsy style of beauty, not without its fascination. Dark hair, dark eyes, pearly teeth, and rounded contours are their heritage. There is a charm about the Spanish women, which the coldest hearts acknowledge. Their figures are generally supple and elastic, their movements full of grace and witchery. Well, in fact, when the great Spanish virtuoso, Madame de Gogne, arrived in New York and began concertizing on the guitar in 1843, the American poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow didn't write about her. He wrote about her indirectly by saying of her guitar, a woman plays it and the devil is in it. So 
This is the first guitar of uh, Spanish design that we know of in the New World. It shows up in a storefront in New York City. It was advertised in the newspaper as being at Firth and Hall, 1831. And what we know of the firm is actually Firth, Hall, and Pond. They're the largest instrument, instrument retailers in New York. They were woodwind makers who then built their own pianos out on Long Island, but all of the guitars they sold were imported. And actually this guitar we know to have been a Panormo guitar. It was specified, um, it was made in London, but modeled on a Cadiz, Spain, Andalusian, uh, Southern Spanish model. So in 1840, Firth Hall and Pond in New York start to make some of their own guitars modeled after this imported Spanish guitar. So whereas normally they were selling their pianos and their woodwind instruments out of their New York City shop, they needed somebody to make guitars for them. Now I'm getting to the point of the presentation this evening. Enter the equation one James Ashbourne. Uh, this is the only known photograph of James Ashbourne as courtesy of Dave Oakes. Um, Dave is my eyes and ears on the ground, as it were. He's a Torrington resident, uh, a mechanic maker of, of Ashbourne imitation banjos and, and wonderful ones at that. Guy owns one. Uh, so I thank Dave for allowing me to use this photograph. It's uh, really quite extraordinary. What we know of Ashbourne, and a lot of this is just coming to light even in the past couple of weeks, and I thank Dave Oakes for this. We think he was born in England, 1814, 15, 16, generally thereabouts. He arrives in New York, we believe 1835. Dave, I think, has identified the ship. Uh, we think we've identified where he came from in England. This is all being worked out as I speak. Uh, we know Dave found in city directories in New York that Ashbourne was listed as making pianos in 1836, and we presume this was with Firth, Hall, and Pond, as they were the piano people in New York at the time. But interestingly, in 1840, he's shown as making guitars, again, presumably for Firth, Hall, and Pond, and it seems likely because his address is shown as Pearl Street, just a couple of blocks from Firth Hall and Pond's headquarters. And again, I thank Dave Oakes for that information. So Firth Hall and Pond, they're importing guitars. Guitars are wildly popular. They want to make more of them and sell more of them. How are they going to do that? Where are they going to do that? Look no further than Connecticut and the Industrial Revolution. Eli Terry, 1806, making clocks in Windsor and then in Plymouth using water wheel power. This is the first instance in the U.S. of mass-produced domestic products using interchangeable parts. Terry has been called the last of the craftsmen, the first of the industrialists. Enter the equation Asa Hopkins in Litchfield County. Asa knows Terry personally. Asa opens his own water wheel power clock factory on the Naugatuck River, runs it for over a dozen years. Shortly thereafter, 1829, he opens up another water wheel powered factory to build nothing but woodwind instruments. This was Fluteville on the Naugatuck River. And there you can see a map that's annotated by the, um, the late Harwinton historian um, Fluteville on the Naugatuck, just north of the Thomaston Dam, which was uh, built in 18, uh, uh, sorry, 1960. You can see Campville to the north. Um, if you look just up north of Fluteville, you can see Ace's uh, Perch Clock Shop, and then just north of that, the Edward Hopkins and Alfred Clock Shop. We know what that looked like. There's an extant photo and here it is. So the Fluteville factory would have looked very similar to this. The Hopkins here was Ace's nephew and they were producing some of Eli Terry's um, inventions and improvements. So Firth, Hall and Pond, 
decide they're going to acquire Fluteville to make their flutes. For starters, let's remember they were woodwind makers originally. That was their primary fare. But uh, they become general partners in 1839, buying in, and they start mass producing woodwinds. They stamp their name on it, but send it to their um, retail establishment in Franklin Square in New York and sell them there. 1841, 42, they become controlling partners and they start making guitars in Fluteville. By 1846, they own Fluteville outright. So here's Fluteville on an early map. And in the 1850s, you see the Firth and Pond, the flute manufactory. Notice just to the south, the Booth dwelling. Uh, we know that Charles Booth was a peddler who sold Fluteville products. Um, traveling around by horse. So those things that didn't get shipped down by stagecoach to New York to sell at Firth Hall Pond were being sold by Charles Booth. These are the extant remains of the foundation of the Fluteville factory um, as taken very recently. So Firth Hall and Pond in Connecticut. We know that Ashbourne was making guitars in New York City for them in 1840. 1842, they send Ashbourne to Fluteville to start making guitars for them there at the Fluteville factory. We know in 1843, Ashbourne was one of the incorporators of the Episcopal Church, true to his English heritage in Walcottville, Torrington. He was naturalized in Litchfield, 1844. His wife died, his first wife died, 1847. She's buried in Plymouth. He remarried then later that year in Torrington. Uh, also in 1847, there's a split in the firm of Firth Hall and Pond. And Fluteville was part of that business equation. Ashbourne decided at that point to remain in business with them, but go it on his own. So he opened his own guitar factory in Daytonville, the northern part of Wolcottville. And there he started producing, mass producing in batches, dozens at a time, um, branding the guitars as being either uh, Firth Pond and Hall, or, or at the time Firth Pond and Company or William Hall and Son and shipping them down to New York. So this is Tarrington as it would have appeared um, when he arrived, we know in 1840 from Orcutt's description that there were 40 dwellings in the town. And Ashbourne didn't pick this location of Daytonville by mistake. Um, Arvid Dayton already had his factory where he was producing organs and melodians in Daytonville. Um, he was using wa uh, water wheel power uh, driven by the East Branch of the Naugatuck River. So Ashbourne bought the building, just two buildings north of Arvid Dayton's factory. And this is Ashbourne's 16 room guitar factory. It had previously, according to Orca, been used to make uh, hoe and rake handles. Again, it's powered by a water wheel on the east branch of the Naugatuck. And as I said, it's just a couple of doors north of Arvid Dayton's organ factory. We know from the census of 1860 that a couple of the people who were making guitars for him uh, were living in a house across the street. They were boarders. One was Chester Smith, a 35-year-old guitar maker. The other was a 19-year-old young lady, Julia Booth, the first female guitar maker in history. She was the younger sister of Charles Booth, the Fluteville peddler. So here we have the map of Daytonville at the time. It shows the Ashburn and Hungerford um, factory. Um, Hungerford was Ashburn's early business partner. He supplied some startup capital just across the street, Arvid Dayton's house, and then the Cook House where Chester Smith and Julia Booth were both residing as boarders. And you can see right across the street, um, Arvid Dayton's organ and Melodian factory. Hungerford and Ashburn themselves lived in town on Prospect Street. 
just across the street and, and up the block from the Episcopal Church. That's where the YMCA is located presently. Ashbourne sold most of his guitars to William Hall and Son. They had a showroom on Broadway at that time. They had a pretty exclusive agreement with him. I found this tremendously obscure mention in um, a New Orleans newspaper in 1855, which if you'll bear with me, uh, really merits reading in its entirety. And this is from 1855. A few weeks ago, I had a most delightful trip to the trout streams on the Naugatuck among the Yankee clock regions of Connecticut. My friend Hall of the extensive and well-known firm of William Hall and Son Music Dealers invited me to visit the factories, plural, of this firm. And the promise of some good trout fishing was too tempting a bait to refuse. Of sport, I had abundance in the knowledge of the extensive business done by the above named house, I found substantial evidence. They have two large factories about eight miles apart one for the exclusive manufacturer of their celebrated guitars. This is Ashbourne's factory in uh, Torrington and the other for flutes, clarinets, fifes and every other kind of whistle imaginable. This is Fluteville. In their factory near Walcottville, they make from four to five dozen guitars every week and are still increasing their facilities expecting to make as many more. This branch of their business has sprung up within a few years and their success in carrying out their determination to make the best musical instruments in the market has given their work a widespread popularity and in fact has resulted in making the guitar a much greater favorite than heretofore as the tone is vastly improved and they do not like the imported instruments crack and fall pieces from the severe tests of our climate. The village where the flute factory is situated is called Fluteville and whistles of all sizes from the big clarinet to the little piccoli are flying about in every stage towards completion. Where they ever find a market for them is the greatest wonder. I just love that. Well. Again, um, not by mistake that Ashbourne locates where he does because the Wolcottville, later to be the Co. Brassworks, are located in Torrington. And the Brassworks were originally owned by the father of Ashbourne's business partner. And then one of Ashbourne's daughters actually marries into the Co. family. So here are these wonderful brass tuners that Ashbourne was hand making of brass from the brass works. Here's another example. Um, they're quite extraordinary, very well made. Um, later on, in some instances, he would stamp them with J. Ashbourne. I know that picture is not very clear, um, but it, it very rarely did he do that because they weren't proprietary per se. Along the lines of proprietary, he did, oops, excuse me, he did have a couple of patents. And the first one was in 1850. And it was for uh, what he called an improved guitar head. And actually, this was a movable capo. And uh, this is the only one known to exist. There might be some others out there. Again, made of brass. It slid up and down the neck of the guitar to change the key of the guitar. So some of these guitars were actually stamped um, if they featured that with J. Ashbourne with patent 1850 um, stamped on them. His second patent 1852 was for improved tuning pegs. Now what we mean here are uh, wooden friction tuning pegs as are used um, to this day on violins and violin family instruments. So some of these that use the tuning pegs are stamped J. Ashbourne with the 1852 patent. And here's a wonderful example of a guitar peg head with the tuning pegs and uh, one of the pegs. And these were uh, machined in the factory. Another uh, feature of Ashbourne's guitars that deserves mention is guitars in the 19th century had what are called bar frets, piece of metal sticking up out of the fretboard. Well, Ashbourne was the first person to use T frets made out of brass 
and the C.F. Martin Company wouldn't start using T frets until 75 or 80 years later. The Naugatuck Railroad figures prominently into Ashbourne's success. Ashbourne knew that the railroad was going to be built because the, the railroad goes right through Fluteville, and he was there for five years, if not more. Um, but Fluteville was not very uh, populated. They weren't turning out enough product, and you know the flutes and all were quite small. Um, the cartage just didn't deserve a train stop. But we see up in Walcottville that John Hungerford of the Brass Works gave heavily for the railroad, as did George D. Wadhams, who, by the way, signed in support of Ashbourne's second patent. So Ashbourne started shipping his guitars in 1849. You can see at the time you could get on a train in Tarrington at 726, connect to the New Haven line at 10.04 in the morning and be in New York City at 11.25 in time for lunch. And that's the Walcottville station as Ashburn would have seen it in his day. Now, uh, his location on the east branch of the Naugatuck River was everything to him. By choosing Tarrington, he enjoyed the water wheel power um, to run his machinery. He had close proximity to his timber resources, spruce for the tops, maple for the necks, maple for some of the backs. He also used wood to build all of his guitar cases in-house. He had a close relationship with the brass works for his tuners, for his frets, for his capos, um, for his case uh, handles, etc. He was close to the train station, and we know for a fact that he went into New York regularly. So here are some of Ashbourne's masterpieces. This is a, a museum quality guitar that I actually purchased off of eBay from somebody in North Carolina years ago. This flamed maple is extraordinary, but I would draw your attention to um, the case which Ashbourne made in his factory. It's called a coffin case because it kind of resembles a, a coffin in which the guitar resides. But the fabrics that he uses for the interiors are some of the most flamboyant felt fabrics that you'll ever see. They're really quite extraordinary. And one of these days I'm gonna mine his, um, uh, his ledger book to try to figure out who, from whom in Torrington was he buying these fabrics. I think that in itself would be a story. So here's one in a, a different light with a flash, you get an idea for the wildness of the fabric. Here's another one in an original case. A uh, couple more with equally wild fabric interiors. Uh, and one more. This, interestingly, this is another Ashbourne that I located and purchased in North Carolina. Uh, another thing Ashbourne did was on his upper level models. Now, mind you, every Ashbourne guitar was the same size and shape. They differed only in their degree of ornamentation. A number one was the basic, a number six was the most ornate. And on his four, five, and six models, he would veneer the backs as well as the necks with Brazilian rosewood. And he chose the most extraordinary Brazilian rosewood veneers and then sliced them in half and book matched them and applied them to the backs of his guitars. And you can see from these examples, um, some of the Brazilian rosewoods are just extraordinary works of art unto themselves. Also on his higher level models, you see ornate wood marquetry that is just to die for, if you'll pardon the expression. Um, you can see some of these uh, wood inlays are really just exquisite um, pieces of art in and of themselves. Um, this is a number six, which I actually found on Craigslist. That's a story in and of itself. I've, I've discovered so many Ashburn guitars over the years. And these were all different pieces of uh, wood cut and inlaid, just magnificent work. Well, uh, we should also mention 
uh, minstrelsy as a phenomenon. Uh, this was a popular form of entertainment. It was predominant in the 1850s through the 70s. Um, somewhat embarrassingly, it was uh, performed by Caucasians in blackface. Um, they would portray themselves as Negroes and perform songs and dances, um, pretend to be Ethiopian as they uh, called themselves. But the banjo being an African-American um, instrument of origin was the instrument of choice um, in minstrel shows. And Ashbourne was quite aware of this and uh, made banjos that are of extraordinary quality. Um, in fact, I think Guy Wolf is gonna be playing one for us a little bit later, which uh, just landed in his hands from uh, Jim Bowman, a great collector of 19th century uh, banjos. Uh, and this one happens to have his 1852 uh, friction pegs, um, so he stamped the headstock of a very rare piece. Uh, let's look very briefly at Ashbourne's production and pricing. Uh, first, I should point out that in addition to making guitars and banjos, he also made violins and instrument strings. In fact, he's the first known manufacturer of guitar strings in the United States. According to his business, business ledger, he shipped 14,000 strings annually to New York City to be sold. We know that in his 21 uh, years of production from Fluteville through the end of his factory in Torrington, he built approximately 12,000 guitars, whereas C.F. Martin, his major competition at the time, only built 8,000 guitars in 65 years. So, Ashbourne had the same workforce, but because he was mass producing, you were at, at least three times more likely to see a Martin guitar in the mar uh, 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 an Ashbourne guitar in the marketplace than you were to see a Martin guitar. And that was right from the 1850s um, through the Civil War. And because of the expediency of the mass production, he was able to sell his guitars for half the price. Now, this account book that Philip Gura uh, brought to light and I mentioned has been digitized. It's really uh, quite an extraordinary piece. Uh, you can see, for example, in November of 1852, he's shipping batches of dozens of number six guitars to William Hall and Son. Um, two dozen number four guitars, et cetera, et cetera. The, the quantity was just vast, but the quality was extraordinary. Um, you can also see in the ledger where he was doing business with the Walcottville Brass Company, with Wadhams, um, Hungerford, other uh, people in Torrington, well-known names. So uh, I just wanted to point out one other thing, and that is that in 1863, Firth Pond and Company separated into a couple of different um, separate concerns. So in that one year alone, Ashbourne stamped his guitars either William A. Pond and Company or William Paul and Son. Uh, and then some of these guitars, the last few years that he made them, he also stamped J. Ashbourne in very small letters internally. This gets back to the one that I bought on eBay that started my fascination. It dates from 1863, precisely. That just happens to be the year that Ashbourne was elected to the Connecticut State Legislature. He began his term in 1864, so he rented his factory. IRS tax records show that he was still producing guitars and sometimes up to 31 a month for the next couple of years, but this would have been out of his house and probably just himself and maybe a helper or two. By early 1866, he has sold his factory to the Excelsior Needle Company. Uh, we know that he's still listed in 1870 in the census as being a guitar maker. Uh, and there you see the revised map of Daytonville where the Excelsior Needle Company then occupies his former fa uh, factory with Arvid Dayton's two to the south. 
Ashbourne stayed on in Torrington. However, he uh, owned a considerable number of, of parcels of land up Prospect Street. Um, and when he eventually died in 1876, the Walcottville newspaper ran his obituary, um, implying that everyone in town knew him, that he had been uh, in not very good health for some years, and that he went downhill pretty quickly. Uh, we also have a copy of his will that is extant, which shows absolutely um, all of his uh, earthly belongings upon his death, and it enumerated uh, many unfinished guitars, uh, as well as guitar making materials and tools. So Ashbourne's achievement, if I can sum this up, is from 1848 through 1863. He was on the East Branch of the Naugatuck in Torrington. It's the first known guitar factory uh, that was exclusively building guitars. Um, his measurements were of a stricter tolerance than some modern guitar factories expect. His guitars were consistent, they were reliable, they were durable, extraordinarily well made, tastefully done, and highly affordable. So his volume of production pretty much ensured that these Spanish style guitars were the guitars that you saw in the marketplace, satisfied the romantic imagination of Americans and has persisted to the present day. And I include myself amongst those enamored. Uh, I'm gonna conclude by saying, were it not for uh, my dear friend and colleague, Peter Zago, uh, much of this uh, uh, research that I've done regarding Ashbourne would not have come to light. Um, Peter is a, a scholar of a 19th century banjo in particular, and an enthusiast, also a collector. He's got banjos. Um, I met Peter when um, he was bidding on an Ashbourne guitar that I had on eBay in 2005, and we uh, struck up a relationship immediately. Um, Peter uh, brought a bunch of us together for uh, a study group in Philadelphia in 2008. Uh, here we are at Fred Oster's shop. Um, you probably recognize a lot of the folks there, Dick Boak from C.S. Martin, Richard Johnson, uh, Jim Baggett, Matty Umanoff, David LaPlante, um, myself, Fred Oster, uh, Tim Crandall, and um, Peter himself. Well, these study groups then resulted in us writing up our research and Peter published the book, Inventing the American Guitar, the Pre-Civil War Innovations of C.F. Martin and his contemporaries. Um, if you don't have a copy, get one. A shameless plug for Peter's book there. Uh, I was greatly honored to be able to write a chapter on James Ashbourne in that book. Um, this then served as the exhibition catalog for a show that was up for the entire year of 2014 at the Met um, on early American guitars, where three of uh, Peter's Ashbourne guitars were um, displayed as part of the collection. And the one in the middle is actually one that I uh, sold to Peter. I think I found that one on, uh, on Craigslist in Cincinnati, as I recall. Uh, also during this time, then Oxford University Press reached out to me uh, to write um, an entry on James Ashbourne for the Grove Dictionary of American Music. So we've got him in recorded history now. But the real joy for me came when the Torrington Historical Society contacted me and said they were going to do an historical marker and asked if I would write some text for that which I was more than happy to do. And it was unveiled uh, a year or so ago. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend uh, due to COVID travel restrictions, but it's uh, in North Tarrington where Main Street forks up into Newfield Road and Winstead Roads. And uh, in addition to uh, the head of the Tarrington Historical Society being present, uh, we have Dave Oaks, um, my eyes and ears in Tarrington, and your next presenter himself, far left, Di Wolf, 
who's now going to be playing some Ashbourne instruments for us. And I'm hoping both banjo and guitar. And with that, I thank you again for your time and attention. I'll turn it over to Guy. It's just so exciting to have this as a, um, a get together, especially with all the sort of amazing people that have done so much for um, Ashbourne. Uh, so one thing just to say, uh, uh, my friend um, Dave Oaks, uh, over the years, he's gotten a lot of very, very interesting instru instruments coming in his doorway. And because we're friends, he'll come over to my shop. Uh, as I'm, I'm a potter by trade, a craftsman, and I sort of have played in New England square dance bands a lot. I live in the town that Ashbourne came to, to Litchfield originally. Uh, and I've just been a very big fan of his uh, through the years. But the thing as a craftsman to say out loud, if, if you can imagine the picture of that building that he's making those instruments in, imagine that everything about what Ashbourne is doing is about joinery. And uh, say, well, I'm just gonna get a guitar. So now all the fans of Ashbourne know all of this stuff. But if you look at where the neck comes together with the body, you know, that's, that's an incredibly important piece of gluing. At the top, he has a, oh boy, he has, you know, a separate piece of wood that's cut and then glued to go into that. Now, when you're talking about thousands of instruments, how is it that he's gotten this so precise that he can do this join and with a glue, think about joinery with glue <laughs> in the winter time and trying to keep a stove going. I mean, it's just, fin it's magical that he got away with what he got away with. And I, I kind of don't understand uh, how it happened. With, with the architecture of these instruments, Lots of people talk about, you know, the banjo pot that he has on this instrument. And, you know, people don't think about this an awful lot, but this particular, this is, this is Jim's uh, honest to God, real Ashbourne. I can't believe I'm touching it. But so imagine this pot is made with five, count them five pieces of laminate put together. So on the inside, there's one, strap of wood, right? So like an eighth or 16th, I mean, it's very thin. And then on top of that, there's one laminate here and one here. And those two are holding in this thicker piece of wood. And guess what? On top of that piece of wood is yet another laminate. So this pot is an architectural masterpiece. There's one, two, three, four, five laminates, which is what gives this thing so much tone. And in fact, it's so loud, I had to put a little something in it. And I don't know how many Ashbourne instruments you guys have heard, but let's see, I put this down a little bit so you can see a little bit more. If I back up.
uh, it's very strange to do this into a machine like this. Um, this is this is an unbelievably exciting instrument to get to play. So as a musician, the few things that are going on here that are kind of un, unstoppable. Uh, this is a concert instrument. It's incredibly light, but the tone of it is extremely precise. When we were talking before about the pegs, so 1852, Ashbourne came up with this peg. And just to kind of explain it as a, uh, you know, a technical thing, the top of this peg is really, really small then where the hole goes through is, is much larger. Maybe if I turn it to the back, you can see that a little, uh, come on, a little bit better. So it has a big hole going into this thing. And then the top is small, which is kind of like making a gear. So they're very, very, very uh, easy to tune. And you know, for a banjo from 1860, you really, you literally could go on stage with this thing. It's, it's a great, great instrument. Is that too loud or too soft or any of those things? I can't Just tell. Right. I think it's great. Sounds great. Oh, okay. And people are writing in the chat that it's wonderful banjo playing and they really appreciate your descriptions of what you're, you know, what what you're talking about. So well, it's just as far as uh, if you my, my father in law was I'll turn it so you can see it. My father in law was a, uh, a famous early music instrument maker. He made viola da gamba uh, in Boston. And so I, you know, I grew up with it, or I, you know, when I got married, I got to be around, you know, a world renowned luthier. And when you, when you start looking at how these things are made, it just, you sh your head just shakes it. How, how he did this. I mean, it's, there are so many questions in my head when, I mean, if you look at other guitars, how many people are putting, uh, uh, this is the lowest level instrument that he made, right? It's a number one. There's a, there's a hardwood veneer on the neck. I mean, who, who does that? And when you're selling it at half the price of Martin, how do you do that? I mean, it's uh, all, oh yeah, I, I don't think I, I don't think I've played this thing, have I? So right now I have this tuned low. Listen to all that sound.
just phenomenal that there's that kind of set this thing is 10 years before the civil war you know how how is that uh we sort of figured out because it this is the one with the you know the cut on it here so he stopped doing that cut in 1855 <laughs> i mean it's just impossible just impossible um it, it's a real honor to get to play for some of these people that i've uh just watched and uh been interested in for all these years and i can see a few faces that have some instruments i wish i could touch <laughs> uh how are we doing for time i don't know how much more of this do you want from me i i think you can play i could think you play one more people are clapping and uh saying don't <laughs> stop so um but we do have to stop at some point but we'd love to hear one more Just because the, the person who has done so much for all of us is Dave Oaks. He did this banjo from pictures, you know, and measurements from, uh, you know, uh, Greg Adams and uh, George Wonderlich. Uh, and then all those wonderful pictures that everybody's put up of their beautiful instruments. everybody I, uh, that was wonderful thank you so much since that came through on chat while guy was playing was asking if we know why um ashbourne didn't leave the factory to his family um is there do we know that information or why did he decide to sell it hard to tell uh we know that ashbourne's son john um who worked in the factory uh fought in the civil war uh, I don't have exact dates, but I know he was away in 1863, um, so he would not have been present. Um, beyond that, uh, really, it was it, it was in the nature of the industrial enterprise that without the master mechanic, um, the shop really couldn't continue. Um, because each of the workers had a specialized task in the production process, but alone could not make an entire instrument. Um, so it would have been exceedingly difficult for the factory con to uh, continue. And he just didn't have uh, any offspring who would have been interested in taking over. You know, his daughter married into the Cove family. His um, his son ended up uh, working in other um, other factories, actually in the Torrington area. As I recall from uh, John Ashbourne's obituary, it mentioned that he um, you know, did work in other manufacturing uh, 
capacities in Torrington, but uh, none of which had to do with guitars or musical instruments. Okay, wonderful. Does anybody else like to unmute themselves and ask a question to Guy or David? And somebody did ask on, um, on chat if we would be uh, putting this up on uh, YouTube and yes, we will do that. So we'll put a message out so that everybody knows that happened. I, I would like to just say out loud that, um, uh, especially from what uh, David was just saying, um, I often, when I'm talking about this guy, say that basically he was the Henry Ford of the guitar. So the, the fact that this guy is making this sort of quantity of it, uh, really, can you imagine when the Model T uh, was going, if Ford had died, you know, what, what would have happened to the factory? I mean, it took them quite a while to sort of get out of the Model T and into a Model A and so forth. But um, the other just sort of quick thing to say out loud, Flukeville was very, very close to Thomaston where Seth Thomas was. And Thomas, uh, Seth Thomas was doing very, very intricate small parts that always interchange. So the idea of what uh, Ford did and what Ashbourne did was really happening in the clock world a little earlier. And I just wanted to get that in there. Great, thank you. David, do we know how many um, of his uh, musical instruments are still around today? Uh, I was just answering that in the chat. Um, to the best of my knowledge, uh, and this is just based on those that I, for which I've recorded the serial numbers, there are about 400, uh, but who knows how many others are out there in people's closets or under their beds. Uh, you know, over the years, some have turned up on eBay, Craigslist, and elsewhere that are really quite amazing. So there are others to be found. Okay, wonderful. And Mark, maybe you can answer this question um, more accurately than I can, but could you explain to people where exactly the factory stood? Like what's there in its place now? Sure, did I unmute myself successfully? Yes. You did. <laughs> so the, uh, the factory was at the very beginning of the Newfield Road. Uh, if you're heading up the Newfield Road toward Winchester, um, the factory would have been on your left and it would have been between the Newfield Road and the Naugaduck River. It's roughly where the parking lot is for the Evangelical Baptist Church today. Okay, perfect. That's exactly what they, what they thought. And right near where the sign is. <laughs> right. I think people want to go, go find the sign. <laughs> Look for the exactly. sign at the beginning of the Newfield Road and you'll be there. <laughs> Okay, any more questions? Any last questions before we wrap up? We have a lot of really nice comments uh, from everyone on online. If nobody else has any additional questions, we'll wrap it up for tonight. Thank you to you both. Uh, you were a great compliment to each yeah. other, um, both with the music and the history. It was fascinating. And uh, we really, really appreciate oh. you uh, joining us tonight, everyone from all the different locations. Thank you so much. And people are still clapping in the chat. So <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, you, audience. Thank you. Thank presenters. you very much. Hopefully we see y'all soon. Good night.